Hey, welcome to episode 262 of Shane Plays Geek Talk. Thanks so much for pressing play. This episode, we're going to be talking with Joseph Wolf of Reaper Miniatures about their new tabletop RPG, Dungeon Dwellers. That's right. Not only are they well known for their extremely nice minis, but now they have a uh, tabletop RPG and it's sort of old school influenced, old school style, but using modern design. So we'll be talking with Joseph today about that. Other highlights include uh, a little bit of Reaper Con chat. Joseph has some interesting RPG design highlights, including Forgotten Realms, Deadlands, and Blood of Heroes. Uh, Love it or hate it, 5e is very successful at what it does. Which dungeon dwellers came first, the minis or the RPG? Tolkien orcs versus Warhammer orcs. Super quick hot takes on the Rings of Power TV show. I freely admit to and don't apologize for being RPG system promiscuous. Innovation in RPG design is groovy, but you don't have to innovate. Just innovate. You don't have to innovate just to be cool. Uh, You'll hear all of that and more in today's episode. And also, I want to make sure to mention, if you didn't check out last episode, episode 261, that was an interview with George McDonald, who is the co-creator of of the Champions Superhero RPG, and also the co-founder of Hero Games, and my guest co-host on that episode was DM Mike, Mike Stewart himself, of the Save for Half podcast, so make sure to check that out. With no further ado, let's get to today's episode. So away we go. Shall, shall, shall we play a game? Why, yes, I believe we shall. Oh, I got a live one here. <laughs> Getting geeky all up in your podcast. It's Shane Plays Geek Talk, a journey into the things we love. I'm your host, Shane Stacks. Thanks so much for pressing play. As always, got a great episode. And this time, it's it's going to be a blend of two things that gamers love, tabletop gamers. One, minis. And two, role-playing games. So, and this is, this is a kind of a cool product or a cool project, whatever, that kind of blends both together in a way that um, I haven't seen very often. So uh, welcome to the show, Joseph Wolf of Reaper Miniatures. Joseph, welcome to Shane Plays Geek Talk. Hey, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Yeah, man. Glad to have you here. Um, We met at the most recent North Texas RPG Con, and we're going to be talking today, among other things, about Dungeon Dwellers. Uh, which is, and I'm going to have you, I'm going to give you a chance to clarify on this, but it's both a, a tabletop role-playing game engine rule RPG, if you will, and a line of minis from Reaper. Um, and, and, but they can also kind of blend together, uh, which, which is really cool. So I will definitely give you a chance to elaborate on that. Uh, tell us, what is your, position, title, you know, whatever at, at Reaper. I'm Reaper's head writer and, uh, I guess line developer, designer, developer. Uh, I, I am dungeon dwellers, um, author. The author of dungeon dwellers. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to say that, that when I met you at North Texas RPG con, I really appreciated your energy. You're a very enthusiastic, friendly person. Um, I, I ran Middle Earth role playing, and it ended up getting quite a bit of interest. And you were like, "Dude, you just kind of like stopped me in the high in the hallway." You're like, "Dude, that's so cool! You ran Merc, da, 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 and you were talking about that." So I just really appreciated your outgoing, you know, personality and friendliness. I mean, that's why most people go to cons, right? First and foremost, it's t- to uh, play games that you love. Maybe you get to play new games you don't you normally get to play. But it's also to meet people. Right, you build up your con family. So I, I really appreciated that outgoing personality, uh, which definitely helped you. I watched you demo Dungeon Dwellers more than once, and that 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 energy, you know, um, is uh, it was really good. You know, you could tell you're like, hey, and you're excited about Dungeon Dwellers, and you wanted people to know about Dungeon Dwellers. And we also, I'm going to mention this briefly because none of this is official. None of this has even really been talked about yet. Uh, But there was a little bit of discussion, very informally, 
Okay. I don't want to get uh, Joseph committed to something and the Reaper's like, what did you say? Yeah, don't get me in trouble. Inf- don't get me yeah, in I'm trouble. Not get you in tr- I'm not going to get you in trouble. <laughs> there was very informal discussion with, I think, myself, Alan Grow. I think you were lurking around, and Michael Badalato, who's one of the main people from North Texas, that wouldn't it be cool during a North Texas RPG con to maybe bring some people over for a tour of Reaper. And that was very informal. Nobody committed to anything, but I just want to say that I would love to see that happen. The next time I go to North Tar- Texas RPG con, I sure wouldn't mind popping over to Reaper and seeing what's uh, go- going on. I over there. suggest you so, make a phone call. And yeah, so, uh, yeah. I, I, I am aware that such things do happen uh, yeah. uh, on a fairly regular basis, having been witness to them. Um, so yeah. by all means, Make a phone call, right? And then just yeah, make so, arrangements. And I, from what I understand, it's it's yeah. kind of an informal show up, quick tour of the right. facility, answer questions, and have fun. Yeah. So I just I want to I, I I'm going to follow up on that. I know people are like, oh yeah, that'd be really cool. Um, so, but again, I want to make it real clear that you didn't nope. officially or unofficially commit to anything. You were just kind of standing around while the discussion was going on. So such things um, do happen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think they said back in the day, uh, you know, cause North Texas RPG con is I think entering its second decade now. And I think in one of the earlier ones, if I remember right, um, then Doug from who has passed away now, Doug Ray, I think there was maybe at one of the earlier North Texas RPG cons, maybe there was a, somebody headed over to the Reaper. I'm not sure. But speaking of Reaper and people learning more about what Reaper does, you just had Reaper con. Yep. Okay. So folks, we are going to be the majority of this episode. We will be talking about dungeon dwellers, which is, uh, and this is my term. I'll let, uh, Joseph described it the way he does. I would say it is a sort of old school style dungeon crawl game, but it's it's a new set of rules. Um, that's what I saw. But I'll let Joseph explain more of what it is. Uh, but before we get into that, tell us a little bit about ReaperCon. Uh, this is I guess it's like my tenth anniversary ReaperCon of running games, writing and running games for them. Um, it's effectively my well, let me, so. Attending. Let me let me jump in then. So mm-hmm. you're you've been a Reaper fan, friend of Reaper for a decade, but you just yeah. recently longer, okay. much longer. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> it, we um, we started messing around with 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 setting stuff, and we we produced a number of other games. We produced uh, 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 Dark Heaven and Legends Apocalypse. Um, we produced a couple editions of Warlord. Um, which is our own proprietary uh, war game skirmish r- rule set, and it's very fun. Um, but uh, after all those years, we decided we we wanted to do something more significant, and we had a lot of material written. I mean, it, it went into the can; it would go in cycles, and based upon what my other job allowed me to develop. And then uh, we looked at the big pile, and we we're like, you know, we really should do something with all that. Um, and as a result, uh, Dungeon Dwellers kind of came out of that. So in general, uh, at, at Re- so Reaper does a lot, and that's one of the reasons that I like to do these podcasts in, on a variety of subjects, because I didn't even know Reaper had those product lines other than minis. So like when if I go to ReaperCon, and here, here's the funny thing. My brother, who's not a gamer at all, happened to be in the Dallas area during ReaperCon. And he's he he travels a lot for work, and he knows I'm a gamer. So he happened to stay at the hotel that ReaperCon was happening at, and he was calling me and like, man, there's all these gamers, and he was sending me pictures and everything, and and uh, and then I know a couple of people. I think like uh, Zach Glazar, Zach Glazer, mm-hmm. and um, Michael Battalato were at ReaperCon, if I yep. remember right. So they, they were, and, and Jennifer Jennifer Glazer as well. So. Um, and they were they were posting a lot about it. So, what is it like? What what is going to ReaperCon like? Is, it, is, what, is there anything different about it from another well, like? North interestingly, I mean, it's, it's it's not really a. If you go to Origins or Gen Con, those are very much trade shows, right? Um, they may have started off as something else, but they they really they've changed a lot. So they're trade shows, and so it's you know here's all our cool stuff. ReaperCon. Right. Is is still very much tied to its roots, and I think the first one was two thousand and four, if I if I recall correctly, 
And uh, it's a fan count. It's you like games. I like games. You like miniatures. I like miniatures. Let's get together for a couple of days and get, like completely nerd out. And it, it hasn't changed a little bit since, except for the fact that it's gotten bigger. Uh, I think we have a I think we have a thousand tickets that we can have per day. I think is, is kind of sort oh, of where wow. things that, are at. That's that is that is pretty yeah. And and, and we're not and I don't think we're quite at capacity because we're still kind of rebuilding after you know the COVID shutdown. Uh, but uh, we're getting there. I mean, our, our exhibitors hall is pretty full. We have room to move. We have room to not move. Uh, we have room to grow. We're at the Embassy Suites, which is a fantastic venue. I absolutely love the staff. They're super cool and very and that's, flexible. Is, and that, very is that right in Dallas? It's in it's in Denton, I think. Is it okay? Yeah, I'm not that's local, where so I'm just is. like they they just pick me up and drop me off, and I run games nonstop. Right. And then I, they, then they they put me on a plane again, and I fly home. And off you go. So, but yeah, Reaper is actually lo- Reaper's located in Denton, right? Denton, yeah, yeah. Denton, okay. Which isn't far. It's um, like, like forty minutes away or something like that. Thirty minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, the, it's the Metroplex area. I mean, yeah, it's one big urban yeah. sprawl. But ReaperCon yeah. is it's a great it's a great event because uh, in the very short time that we've been running events, and that, you know, not Gen Con, we haven't been around for like fifty years. Um, but th- we have our, we have grown. We have grown a lot, and as a result, we we're able to de- add D and D encounters. We're uh, an adventures league rather. We're able to add Pathfinder Society. Uh, we have a lot of people running their own stuff. We have vendors. Um, it, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's a con. It's a game. Con. Con. Yeah. It's a game. It just con. happens to be focus. put on by Re- now. Yep. Does Reaper officially put it on or is it just called Reaper con? Oh, it's Reaper puts it on. <laughs> so Reaper puts it on, but they don't, yeah, Oh yeah. like you said, it's not a trade show. They don't restrict it to just Reaper products no. or like, come have fun. Come game. We, Warlord games was there. There's a lot of companies yeah. that were there. Um, and you know, <clears throat> Uh, like I don't think we have we haven't had Rathum or Iron Crown there in a long time. Rathum I think shows up occasionally, but um, not in the last few years. But it, it's not restricted that way. It's just basically, hey, you know, we're, we're the hosts, so it's like here's this cool event, come play with us. And that's how it's always been structured. Even even when we were back in the, we used to actually have it at the Reaper. Uh, facility, the Reaper compound, and it was out of the warehouse. And I used to run. They'd tuck me away in the back. They move all the hardware, all the equipment out of the way, and then they would put me in like a little corner somewhere, and I'd run games all day. And mm-hmm. uh, it, it, it doesn't get more down and dirty than that than playing in the warehouse. And, and that's our start, right? I mean, we played upstairs, and then it just, it just changed. It's like in 2012 they had me back, and I ran kind of a mix of Savage Worlds and Pathfinder uh, in our setting, and it just took off. And the bosses are like, make sure he comes back every year. And then decades plus later, uh, they hired me full time as, as their full time line developer after we convinced them to do Dungeon Dwellers role play. So, so what did that feel like to go from being, I would say, that a super fan, uh, a, a player, whatever, somebody who's a big customer, loves the Reaper experience? How did that feel to be brought on as an employee? Uh, it's very humbling. Uh, I mean, we work with some very, very talented, creative people, uh, the sculptors and the painters and, and just, uh, and, and just the staff themselves. Um, they're all very, very invested in in the success of what we do. And, but their, but their interests are all over the place. They're into like Pathfinder, they're into 5e, they're into GURPS, they're into all these different games. And so it's, it's kind of cool to kind of sort of come into an environment where there's all these other nerds. And, um, and so coming in as, as an author, it was a little scary, too, because all of a sudden it's like, eh, I, well, I mean, it's, I work remotely, so I don't have to I don't have to go into work every day. I just get up, climb into my pajamas and go downstairs. And, well, and you go to work, work every day. day. You just... Yeah, I do, I, go, I do go to work, but it's just but it's not like that. It's not like I have a commute and I have an office at right. Reaper HQ. Or no, I'm with you. I've, I've been yeah. a remote worker even before COVID started. So, uh, yeah. so yeah, it's, you're still going to work. It's just a different. It's, yeah. it's, you just don't have a commute. So, um, and there's, you know, there's dangers on the flip side. Sometimes it's hard to, you know, when you're at an office, you're like, it's closing time and you go home and you're off work. When you work at home, sometimes it's hard to make that distinction, you know? Yeah. So, but anyway, like last, like last night, the, the wife wanted yeah. to go to bed. So I was like, okay, cool. Let me run downstairs and check on all the animals, make sure everything's cool. And I looked over at my computer and I had this idea that I've been kind of mulling over. So I sat down and half an hour burns by. And the wife had already right. gone to bed, so I have to like. I'm like, oh crap! <laughs> right. And that happens a yeah, lot. 
it's really, I do that all the time. I'd be like, let me just run upstairs and check on something. And then, so yeah, I've tried to get better about that, especially if we're like waiting to start a movie or something. And I'm like, Oh, I just need to go check something or they're waiting on dinner. So, um, so ReaperCon, like, uh, I, I love the fact that you mentioned that the people at Reaper play a lot of wide variety of games. Cause I am, I am, I, I am now, and I have always been, and I make no apologies for it. I am system promiscuous. I like to play different systems at different times. And if you try to lock me into just one game for the rest of my life, I would be miserable. So like with my, with my weekly group, I run D and D for them. But anytime I get a chance to play another game, I will. And that's one of the reasons I like going to cons is to play all these, this wide, wide variety of like in just past few years, I've become much more of a GURPS gamer. Um, been getting into uh, Victor Raymond uh, from the TechML Foundation has been, you know, nice. getting me into TechML. I'm fascinated with TechML. Um, Rock on, man. That's awesome. Yeah, I just let you know, like you said, I was running uh, Middle Earth role playing at 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 at, um, at North Texas RPG Con. So um, I like to do. I like to get exposed to a lot of different stuff. So. Uh, and I like to see how the systems work. So I was one of the kids, like when I was a kid, I would buy a, a role-playing game thing and I'll probably never get to run this with anybody. Right. But I want to see how the rules work and I want to see all the, you know, so I'm, I'm really into that. I like to see how different systems work. Um, Same. So at, at ReaperCon, like what kind of, it sounds like it's a pretty good spread of games, but is it is it more old school or is there like a lot of new stuff being run? It was, it was you know it, it was us, five e, and Pathfinder Second Ed. Um, and in terms of dungeon dwellers, it, we were at North Texas RPG Con because we really wanted the audience to see the old school in what we're right. doing. But uh, we are very much new school in terms of uh, our love of consistency. We don't like a lot of if-then rules. Um, we, we want a tight little system where even if you don't know the specific ruling, you can guess based upon how everything else in the system works. So okay. there isn't a lot of consulting of the rule book. Like if you watch me run a game, you don't see me checking the rule book unless I'm looking up a spell description. Uh, and even then that's rare. Um, so and that's, what we, that's one of the goals. So it's like intuitive based. Yep. What? It's intuitive on what should happen based on what you've already seen. Is exactly. It, is that, is you know it, how ability yeah. scores are put together. You know how proficiencies right. are put together. You know how saving throws work. That's like 85% of the game. And so if you know that, roll a d20, high rolls good, low rolls not good, add the modifiers, what you got. And, and that's how it works. And that's, that's really what we wanted. When we first sat down and started talking about it, we were like, we want this to be familiar. We want any person right. of any edition of, of, of D&D, any edition, We'll know 80, 85% of this game without even cracking it open. And when you get to that 15%, though, and this is important, it, it's all in the flavoring, right? It's all in that, like that last 15% secret sauce, which makes our game stand out a little bit. And that's, that's really where the designer in me really gets to really flex some muscle, you know, and come up with some right. new ways to do stuff. Well, let's dig into that a little bit. I did want to say on a ReaperCon, if, if I understand correctly, it's, it's always Labor Day weekend. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so folks, if you want to go check out what sounds like another great convention in the North Texas area, go check out ReaperCon. So, uh, Love to play with fun. you. Come play with yeah. us. Come play with Reaper. So, mm -hmm. uh, And like again, I love the fact that Reaper puts on a fan con, that they don't try to make it a stealth, hey, we're going to market Reaper to you. I mean, I'm sure they don't mind if people come and buy Reaper stuff. but Oh, no, you know, we love that. Yeah. Yeah, there's some, it sounds like they're supporting the gaming community in general. I think that's fantastic. So yeah. Um, so uh, I want to talk. You were talking about the designer in you and all that. You know, we we talked a little bit about Dungeon Dwellers as a old school feel game, but with with uh, sensibilities uh, that are that are maybe not old school as far as the design, but the feel would be old school. Uh, mm -hmm. But before you mentioned your your designer and you, so how where, what background did you come from, like writing or designing or or whatever before you became the the author on um, 
dungeon I dwellers. Go, I went to school for biology, but I quickly discovered unless yeah. you're in the top six percent of your of your trade of your field, you're not going to do anything. You're going to spend the rest of your life in a tree with a frog in one hand, thermometer in the other, and it's going to be a miserable solitary existence. So I I abandoned that after uh, my first attempt at graduation. And I just floated around. I did all kinds of different jobs. I worked warehouses. I did all kinds of stuff. And uh, I fell in with the writing crowd because I was running games all the time. And uh, it just kind of sort of blossomed. And then I made some friends at TSR uh, at Gen Con Indy. This is back when, oh no, this was actually Milwaukee still. And they gave me, a, a very generously gave me a leg up. And they gave me a, a couple modest projects. Um, and uh, did fairly well, relatively speaking. Um, I wrote Skullport for AD and D Second Edition uh, for the Forgotten Realms, and I got to play in the sandbox that Ed Greenwood and Stephen Shend created, and it was very humbling to do that. Made a lot of mistakes, <laughs> a lot of epically bad mistakes. And then uh, my real, my real kind of step up was with Deadlands. I was working with Shane Hensley and the crew as just a freelancer, just some guy who. I've got these ideas. I want to, it would be kind of cool if I saw them in print. And then they very kindly gave me uh, opportunities. And I, I got to write the boom towns. I got to write about dinosaurs in the old West. And so, but uh, flash forward many years later, I, I called Reaper out of the blue when I was working at a hobby shop of all places. And I just I established a rapport and uh, made friends with, with Ron, uh, who is my publisher editor and my, my eternal bromance. Um, and, uh, he's the creative director at Reaper Miniatures and, and he's, he's my audience. He's the guy I always write for. It's like, if he thinks it's cool, I think I'm on the right track. Um, he's my litmus test. And, um, and so it, that's just kind of sort of, it went, it went from there. But yeah, I, 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 like many people in the industry, I came from something completely not English. I didn't come from journalism. I just, I know how to string a couple words together, apparently. Um, I always tell people when I type, when I write, it looks like a T-Rex with boxing gloves, hammering away on the keyboard. Um, and that's me, right? I'm just this, this big guy hunched over the keyboard, beating away. And I, I just throw, I throw words on the page until, until they stick, until they look right to my eye. And then thankfully, I have very talented editors that fix my many, 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 many glaring mistakes. Um, so yeah, that's basically it. I mean, it's, I was all over the place, dude. So I'm looking here, um, and I see in, in addition to Skullport mm -hmm. uh, with TSR uh, for the Forgotten Realms. Um, looks like you did some work with. Um, in it, you mentioned Deadlands, uh, but I, some I see some Blood of Heroes work here. So yep. uh, tell us about that. That's interesting to me because. Uh, I'm a, I'm a big DC Heroes fan. Yeah, DC. Right. I love the Megs system. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very cool system for superhero games. Um, you know, the the it's almost a, it, like everybody says it now, but I'll say it anyway. If you're going to do a superhero game, you have to have a system that can have Superman and Batman in the same encounter. And yep. Megs did that really well. So, mm -hmm. um and then I also see that you worked uh, some with Legends of the Five Rings here. So, yeah, um, I did. That was that was really right. minor, though. I just set some monster stats and some. I also rewrote the armor system so that it it did what I wanted it to. But yeah, that's yeah. still pretty. That's a pretty good. Um, that's a pretty pretty good uh, uh, variety of of game systems to have worked on. And I mean, I've heard of all of them, so that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, Blood of Heroes was was a lot of fun, but it was it was yeah. it was rough. I had I rewrote the NPCs. I wrote I rewrote like the entire NPC section, which was like a yeah. hundred and eleven, hundred and sixteen NPCs, and that was that was way more work than I signed up to do. <laughs> Let me tell yeah. you, that was way that was a very foolish thing on my part. Um, but it was cool that that we were able to do it, and it's a, it's a great game. Well, in the in the rear view mirror, you can say at least you got a credit out of it, right? So that's exactly, that's, uh, that's pretty experience. much all I got for it. <laughs> yeah, it's experience and credit. So, uh, yeah. and I see here that you've done some work with um, with uh, Castles of Crusades. Um, yeah. Initially, yeah. We, initially we, what we were doing is we were, I, I was running Castles and Crusades because it, 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 it scratched the itch uh, mm -hmm. of, of, a, of a d and game, but mm -hmm. it didn't have all of the um i would hate to use the word blemish 
But the fact of the matter is, is I'm not a big fan of inconsistencies. I hate having to tell people, roll low for this, roll high for this, roll a D6 to find a secret door, roll percentages to do this. It, nothing's wrong with any of that. I mean, that's all old school. My, t- my, my shelves are full of that. But teaching people those rules, is, it's, it's archaic. And um, I, I, don't, I, I don't love that. Uh, having teach yeah. that, but so but Castle and Crusades is you know dealt very nicely with with what's the the siege engine does a lot of things yeah. really well and it it, it pushed well. the game forward and it was uh, it was it was well supported and the guys at Troll Lord Games are phenomenal and super cool yeah um, and um, and so that we we initially thought it would be kind of cool to support that and so like the Vanishing Blackguard was, was Castles and Crusades. And for a number of years, I ran Castles and Crusades at, at Reaper Cons. Um, <clears throat> but what we found is, is that if I advertised 5e, every seat was full. And Castles and Crusades, Castles and Crusades was like 50% full. And so right. we, we struggled and, to fill our tables. Right. I, I can see that. So first of all, if, if we're going to talk about Castles and Crusades, um, like those Troll Lords is my neighbors. Like I've, I've been to their uh, offices, if you will. Um, you know, I, I know um, Stephen um, and, you know, like Todd. And now I haven't met Davis personally. I have a pretty good relationship with, with Stephen and, and Todd. And, I, you know, they've been out there doing it. They run a very smart business. In fact, I had Stephen on not that long ago talking about, you know, practices he did in his personal business that helped him weather the COVID storm because he wasn't doing anything out of China. He was doing it all locally Um, just based on business principles he'd already put in place. But the point is what I really want to say is I always like to give castles of crusades and troll Lords a shout out Mm -hmm. um, because they were one of the first to jump on the OGL and do something with it and get out there before it was a proven thing and and do something relatively new. I mean, if you right. looked at the, the earliest C and K, or, or if you looked at the earliest version of the rules that they produced, you know that that that, and, they, and they've done a lot of additions. They've done like nine printings right. of that game, um, and they're all different. So, the, in my opinion, those are all additions. But that's that's neither here nor there. Um, but but the thing is, is that they 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 had the knight. That was a player character option, right? You yeah. know, and and they they put the assassin back in. Yeah, good or for bad, I don't know. It varies in opinions. Um, but the thing I, is, I like the, having an assassin. I don't, I don't have uh, any problem with the Dude, the thief stuff, is the, yeah. the rogue is the assassin. He has a backstab ability. You don't need yeah, an right. assassin. Um, but the thing is, is that they did great things and they did inspiring things. They have aired, they have, well, they're still going strong. Uh, they are. And they, and they're, they just, yeah. they, they just produced like a mega edition of the monster of the monsters and, and treasures book. And yeah. they're just doing well, they're great stuff. They're also doing the, uh, they're doing the starship. And I know we're not here to talk about castles and crusades. I'll yeah, but it's cool. That, but it's inspirational, but, right? It's inspirational. Yeah, I want to give them a cool. shout out. And, totally. You know, they also, not only did they get out there almost, you know, one of the first to run out there on the OGL and really jump in. And before it had even really been legally proven what could all be done yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and built a business off of it. Um, they also, this, like you're, t- you were talking about the siege engine. Uh, it's an attribute based check. Like if you want to do something mm-hmm. strength related, use your strength. If you want, and that was way ahead of its time. Yep. You know, um, that that was way ahead of its time. So it, it, anyway. it was it was it was mechanically it was mechanically satisfying, and it also was kind of right. Elegant. And I, I, I yeah, and I ran it for a long time. I ran it for, but it was and it was foundational to. It, it, it taught me a lot about what I wanted to do. And you know, talk about five e. I, I've got it. I mean, I like I like older games. I like different game systems, and I like uh, you know different stuff. I, you know, I, I could, I'd probably be happy playing OSR games the rest of my life if if I had to. But I Five E has been a huge hit, and I have to give nothing but credit mm-hmm. to Wizards of the Coast for the success of Five E. I mean, it wasn't just them. There were a lot of different factors that came together to help the rise of 5e but it didn't hurt at all that they put out a really good system i mean 5e plays well you know um you know you can quibble over mechanics and this and that but it plays well so when you have the people that are 
just seeing D and D in pop culture all of a sudden again over the past few years, or they watch Critical Role or whatever, or you know, and then they try it out. They're not scared off by the rules, right? Yeah. I mean, D and D plays pretty well. The five E does. I have to. I have to give it to them. So it's it's certainly um, ubiquitous. And Wizards of the yeah. Coast was uh, they leveraged good design um, yeah. and attractive. I mean, it looks nice, right? Right. And they leveraged, uh, you know, the event, right? They leveraged COVID. Like we were all hanging home and we were on Zoom, and so all of a sudden people wanted a tabletop, and it brought a lot of people to the in, to to the game and which is great um five e's five e is like four e and in, in, in the respect that it met all of its design goals like they had very specific design goals you can see them in the design and then they met those goals and <clears throat> but it's it, it's an ever-changing thing you know so so D D one which is coming um is, is going to be reflective of again those changes you know the changing climate so it'll be interesting to see where it goes. Personally, 5e is a great example of lots of great mechanics that can be borrowed and then applied to an OSR, uh, an OSR-inspired rule set to make DDRPG. And that's what we did. We borrowed the short rest and the long rest because it puts characters back into play, right? It doesn't, you don't have to spend three months yeah. recuperating. Right. You know, you're not playing Rollmaster where sitting six months out while your character's arm heals. That's not fun. Going back into the dungeon is fun. Um, the power level of it is significantly ramped up from previous editions, which is very attractive to modern players. Um, well, let me we don't want to grind, that. but no, it's, it's a great. I love. I, I'm not one of those persons that bashes on Five E too loudly. I mean, there's parts of it that drive me nuts, but every well, game you can quibble with anything, but it's absolutely. It's Five E has been a very well received edition of yep. whether you can't quibble that D and D is the most well known. Most no played RP tabletop RPG out people there. People refer to people refer to D and role playing games as D and D. So you're D&D, playing with D and D with your friends play. this weekend, and you're like, well, "No, we're yeah. playing we're pl- we're playing Middle Earth role play." But your yeah. mom thinks of it as it become it became D and D. Well, it's Coke. <laughs> yeah, Coke? that's what I said. Like in the South, I don't know about. I know you're in Michigan. So you want a Coke? Yeah. What yep. kind of Coke? Do what you flavor? Want? I'll take a Pepsi. Yeah, I'll take See, a Pepsi. There you go. Yep. So yeah. Pepsi. So uh, Coke deal. is Coke. Coke is shorthand for any soda pop, any soda. Yep. Uh, and D&D, and D&D kind of comes in, right. which is kind of cool, actually. Yeah. So, um, well, yeah, I mean, they just own the, they, they just own the space. I mean, sure with, with, with the non-gamer, they own the space. Now, once you get into gaming, you know, you, you have a wedge of the pie that doesn't play D&D and loves all kinds of other games. Uh, but on the outside looking in, it's all D and D to the average yep. person. So, um, all right. So anyway, so let's talk about, since you brought up some of the mechanics and whatnot, I, I let, I want to clarify a little bit here on dungeon dwellers. So what, what came first, the dungeon dwellers minis or the dungeon dwellers RPG, or were they simultaneous? The miniatures for sure. Ron, Wanted to create a, a fork, and I, I you want to get him on because he can talk about it more authoritatively than I possibly can. But what he basically said was he um, he wanted to create a line of, uh, of of minis that had that old school feel, whereas orcs had kind of become Games Workshop orcs, you know, not, not deliberately, but that's kind of where it headed. He wanted to bring them back to Tolkien style orcs, really ugly humanoids, right? And same thing with a lot of the other figures. Less World of Warcraft, more old school D&D. And so the armor looks like real armor. P- proportions are a little more realistic, although that's debatable. Um, but the thing is, is that it was all about, you know, reestablishing that connection. And Reaper owned the Dungeon Dwellers line from Old Heritage. So they were able to produce these this beautiful range of miniatures. And so it, it set us oh, on so the path the to doing line? the RPG. So the, the lineage is the same Dungeon Dwellers that wasn't Reaper at one point, and then Reaper got yeah. the line? Yeah, okay. Reaper acquired the Heritage line, and they're the ones that I produced the original Dungeon Dwellers, yeah. And, and, okay. and yeah, it's, it's, a neat, it's a neat little ancestry to see it all kind of evolve. And, and now we've got Dungeon Dwellers paint sets, and, and then the RPG kind of evolved out of our love of what those miniatures meant, you know? 
And uh, if you compare, you know, orcs to the DI, to the to the warlord line, it, they're as different as night and day. And well, so there's like kind it. of a continu- like separate continuums. <laughs> I like orcs as, orcs as the ugly humanoid and not the big bulky. I mean, the bulky's fine, but I like a Tolkien orc if I'm going to talk uh, about. You know, it, it's orc, it's right? fun because it depends upon the game. Like if I'm running Warhammer right. Fantasy Roleplay, which I love, I reach for those cool bull orcs, right? right. And, uh, you know, the, the soccer hooligan orc. But when I want to run like against the Dark Master, which is a Middle Earth retro, retro clone, or if I want to yeah. run my game, DDRPG, I like my players to have the Angus McBride orcs from the old Angus McBride paintings from the old Middle Earth uh, uh, yeah. product line. And I, that's, so that's, I have all, that's always going to be the orcs. As long as we're talking about ugly orcs and humanoids, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. have you seen any of the new Rings of Power show? Yes, I have. The first, and I'm not going to get in because I know people have a huge. Dude, we could, that's another whole conversation. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to get into all that. Because people have different opinions on Rings of Power. All I'm going to say is, whether people like Rings of Power or not, the first orc they finally show you is a horror show. <laughs> that yeah. was almost like, yeah, it was almost like those a, are a, those a, are like those are Morgoth's first orcs. Yeah. But here's here's what here's what I here's what I say about Rings of Power because yeah. there are Tolkien purists and there's different kinds of Tolkien purists. You know, right. are there five wizards? Are there more than that? Blah blah blah. Are there pigeons in Middle Earth? Tolkien never talked about them, so they can't exist. So the thing is, here's the deal with the Rings of Power. It's a spectacle. It's as good as television Tolkien is ever going to be. So just sit back and enjoy the ride. That's what I tell all my friends. Just enjoy it. My take on it is it's really, really pretty, well-produced fan fiction. And I'm enjoying it on that level. And There you go. and, And it's beautiful, you know. Uh, it, I could put my quibbling hat on and oh pull god, out, don't know, even don't yeah, hat. you don't want to do that. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> I actually, I think I, I think I told some, and people have different opinions. I'm going to have a show on Rings of Power because That'll people be awesome. are very passionate. About, people are really passionate in on many parts of the spectrum about the yeah. show. Here's my thing on it, and I think I, if I was 20 or 30, this may not be my uh, take on it, but as an as a, I guess, a, an old grognard who's been around the, uh, you know, been around a little while. If I can't be with the one I love, I'll love the one I'm with. And I'm go. enjoying the show. I'm enjoying the show on that level. And that's how so, every fan should go into it. You know, just, yeah, just appreciate yeah. what we're it's giving. beautiful. The production yeah. values. Well, the, the thing is, is that it, it, going back to Tolkien is that, yeah. I mean, I'm heavily influenced by Tolkien and my Ron and I frequently talk about, you know, yeah. what we want to do and we have a middle earth sensibility we love the scope we love the scale right we love the the history we want to go back ten thousand years and talk about that stuff and but we also are grounded in like the the the, the, the slick forgotten realms as well um right. so it's well, it's see, always like an interesting dy- it's a, me too it's a dynamic yeah. pull neither of them has to win mm-hmm. but the dynamic right. pull between the two of them you know makes for some pretty cool content it, it does and i mean there's some games where I just want a quick little romp through the Forgotten Realms. Yeah. But there might be other times where I want to do a real deep, you know, uh, you know, dive into something Tolkien-ish. So, but anyway, so let's talk uh, back to DDRPG, Dungeon Dwellers RPG. So there's a line of miniatures that Reaper produces called Dungeon Dwellers. Yep. But there's also um, a, a role-playing game uh called dungeon dwellers rpg which is presently in its version 2 beta we actually released physical copies of it i actually have da, 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 da. i actually have copies of it right here oh, cool nice. man and and I've got four PDF, pages but, yeah. uh, but but this you don't have this yet this the one we I were don't. giving away no the one we were giving out yeah. was half this thick and it was yeah. only character creation and some basics no this is a felt self contained ready to play Player's Guide, GM, Monster Book. So it's all in here. And this is just, but again, it's our V2 beta. So this is not the, you know, ready for prime time yet, but we are, we are distributing this. It will be available for download for free online eventually. Um, fairly well, soon, if I somebody believe. wants that, if somebody wants a hard copy, can they pay for one or how does that work? 
Uh, well, they, then they'll just take the PDF to Kinko's and get them printed. I got you. Uh, okay. Well, so here's the thing. So but, the, but the long-term yeah. goal is something much uh, – the offering that we're going to have available probably in the spring will be significantly different and okay. much more profound, I guess, is the probably the smartest way to say it, is the plan. Well, I will link – people can go on the show notes at shameplays.com or go to Reaper. Uh, the Reaper website, go to Reaper. We have a banner, so you can easily find all the role plays, including lots of adventures, the V1 rules. I, I will pressure, I will, I will apply a little pressure to get the V2 stuff up as soon as possible, because there's a lot yeah. of people asking for it. Cool. So, um, so yeah, people go to Reaper Mini, not Reaper Minis, ReaperMini.com mm-hmm. slash yep. RPG, or just go to ReaperMini.com, and there'll be links yep. to take it. And there's, and there's a banner. And we have like five or six yeah. downloadable adventures and a bunch of other stuff. So yeah, there's, there's, there's actually a lot of stuff for, to download. For free, there's a lot of stuff. Yep. I mean, you know, it's and there's yeah, more in, like a – And there's yeah. more in the can you guys haven't even seen yet. So, so we're uh, – Lots yeah, more people coming. Can also go to, people can also go to ShanePlays.com, go to the show notes for today's episode, and there'll be links, you know, including – uh, reapermini.com slash RPG. So, um, so what, okay. So uh, right now, uh, there, there's the version one for available for download, which is you character said, creation only. Right. So you're saying hopefully soon that V2 beta will be available for download on the site. Absolutely. Now, Absolutely. And so, and you say that's a more complete like player and GM's guide. It is. It, and and the, a monster okay. manual. It's 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 literally broken up into basically three large sections. It's character creation, which is it's it's cleaned up, refined uh, content from the first from the V1 rules, and then there's a GM section which talks about re- rewards and leveling and all the stuff that you need to be a GM. Also hazards, uh, but it's, everything is very brief and and very very tight. Um, and then there's also a, a, a robust bestiary. Characters right now are levels one through three because we want to by controlling the levels. That's uh, a good. Intro it's a little easier level. to balance this, yeah. right? When we're right. when we're designing, but but we are not going to probably ship with levels one through three. We're still discussing right. what we want to do in the long term. Of course, characters. My goal personally, I want characters to be playable beyond level twenty, which is something five E can't say. That's true. You know, at level twenty, so, you hit the cap. What do you do now? Yeah. You retire and build another character. Uh, right. I would like for our system to, uh, and it's a, it's a goal, it's a very lofty goal, to be playable beyond level 20. Um, so what? Uh, I have a couple of questions here. I'm going to throw Fire them away. out there, and then I'll, I'll try to, because they're, they're kind of different from each other. One is, uh, you know, when I look in the back of the, uh, the PDF, you know, there is an OGL there for Wizards. Um, so I was going to ask what, what edition are you drawing on? And it sounds like 5e is, is some of what you're drawing on mechanically for DDRPG. And the second question is, uh, what, what is the ultimate goal for DDRPG for Reaper? Like why is, why all this effort is, I mean, I, I doubt it's just to give away free D, free PDFs into perpetuity. So I know those are distinctly different questions. So let's start with the first one. like. What what is the is it is it all five e mechanics? No, and then you, no, no. Okay, so not. what 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 is the what is the OGL? So I know you mentioned long rest and short rest. Think, like think what, about mechanics? think about it as Legos, yep. right? Okay. So if you if you have if you have like a, a hero and a GURPS background, you're used to different quantities of Legos, right? Hero gives you a big box of a million little parts, and you can build whatever you want, but it's very complicated and very fussy. I love Hero. Don't get me wrong. GURPS, the pieces are bigger. The chunks of Lego, it's more like a, mo- a model kit. You can build a couple different things with it, but there's still, the modularity isn't quite as, 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 uh, as granular. So DDRPG is built with the idea that, basically, I'm going to give you a bunch of Lego parts, and you can snap them together like little modules, however you want, to build the game and stuff that you want. Now, initially, the offering in terms of the Lego pieces we're going to give you guys is going to be minimal. We're giving you four folk, which is our, our, our version of ancestries, lineages, races, whatever. And then we also have four classes. And they're the most common, most interested. These are the ones that people always want to play. And to I they're some they're the most stuff. common. Right. Exactly. And But again, by restricting what we're offering initially, it makes it easier for us to balance 
later. Releasing 30 classes and races right off the bat is a disaster. I can't even imagine trying to balance that out. Um, but uh, we, we want a consistent, fun, playable experience. We don't want players being really sad about the Beastmaster Ranger 10 years down the road. Um, so that's, that's where it's coming from. We come from, a, it, in actuality, the math is 3X in Pathfinder. That's where the math mostly comes from. Um, but we're bolting on, very ve- elegantly, the pieces of 5th Ed that are beautiful. Short rests and long rests. Uh, their magic system, I, I think their magic system is a huge leap forward in terms of how slots and how you can upscale. But I don't think they went far enough with it. I think there's more, there's, there's more exploration to be done with that magic system. Um, and, uh, and, and there's a you're lot of little things. You're talking about 5E's magic 5E, system? Yep, yep. Okay. 5E's magic. Yep. I, I, the, the, the slot, being able to cast a spell at a higher slot was a very elegant mechanic. Allowing players to prepare like a bucket and just throw the spells into the bucket. And these are the ones I can cast as often as I want today. That's a very elegant mechanic. And it, it, it doesn't get fussy with, with spell points or anything complex like that. It, it's a nice intermediate between a spell point system uh, which can be a little complicated, and the slot system of the earlier editions of DME. Wizards feel uh, robust; they feel fairly powerful, um, and I think that's some great design. I think that they did some great stuff, and so that's for now. In, in the V2 rules, we're using pretty much the spell descriptions out of second, uh, out of out of fifth ed, but we rewrote all the spells to be a lot simpler so that they're not as wordy, and, and also we I got rid of all the all the references to advantage. Uh, we do not support advantage by name because, uh, well, I can we could have a conversation about this that would take the entire session. But basically, it comes down to mechanically, it's a bit of a win button, and disadvantage is a lose button. And it is, it 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 it, it, it it's not a mechanic that I love. It feels very awkward. Um, some people love it, and that's great. I support them. But it's not something that I love, even though we do have some advantage-like mechanics worked in there here and there. Um, as far as the second question goes, uh, is world domination too much of a reach, I guess, uh, in terms of our <laughs> ultimate goal? Uh, yeah, what, why is Reaper just, doing You know, this? why are we yeah, doing this? So, okay. Yeah. We are nerds, too. And wouldn't it be nice to produce content that belongs to us? Um, if we produce 5e material, it gets lost in the vast ocean. And uh, if we write OSR exclusively, right, it gets lost in the vast ocean. But the thing we use around the shop is the bridge product. We, we believe that, you know, new additions tend to fracture the community and not everyone's super happy with the direction of whatever game, you know, fifth ed or Pathfinder two or whatever. Some, many are, which is great. But the thing is, that what if we created a, what if, what if we created a bridge product that the ultimate goal of it is to borrow the best elements from all of these, and then and then very uh, and very uh, just kind of wed those elements together to make a game that a- a- appeals to me. And that's the real thing: is Reaper will own Dungeon Dwellers. We wouldn't really you you would own something with a fifth edition logo on it, but it gets lost. And and so Dungeon Dwellers will be ours. So heavily inspired by earlier editions but with the elegance of the later editions and the consistency as well. And that's really the goal is that we wanted a, we wanted a game we could call our own. And this is a great way to do it. So, uh, so for the time being, uh, you're going to put out beta, beta testing materials. Uh, if people go to the, you know, reaper mini.com slash RPG, um, just go to reaper mini.com. You'll find it. Or, or again, you can go to the show notes at shameplays.com for, for a link. I, I'm to be honest. I'm hoping. I'm hoping we can get a beta 2.1 up. To be honest, because there's always things that I want to. Right, I want to just kind of smooth and yeah. Well, not radically, but just just you know, we find you know errors. You know, it's and that's what we want to do. Is ultimately we want people to play it, try it out, and then get back to me. You can go to our Discord server. There's a DDRPG Discord server for Reaper miniatures. There is a very active forum. For Reaper miniatures, that we even have our own little section. DVRPG. I saw that, yeah, on the, um, right on the ReaperMini.com website. Friend me on Facebook. Yeah. You can't miss me, you know. Um, and and send me. Uh, let's have a conversation. Ultimately, DDRPG is for everybody. It's for all of us to enjoy. I'm not. You know, I'm not. It's not mine. It's ours, and that's what we really want. Is it's it's like our it's like our fan convention. We want it to be for everybody. 
you know, and if you're you're not happy with 600, 900 pages of rules, you know, and if you're not happy with this other flavor of 900 pages of rules and you, you want something that feels like an OSR game but plays modern, um, I think that's where DDRPG really finds its niche. Well, and the fact that we're wedded to a wonderful line of miniatures. Well, that, that's really another thing I was going to ask. Leg up. So it's not... It doesn't sound like it's a cynical ploy to say, hey, here's a free first through third level RPG. And oh, by the way, on the back, there's all these minis you should buy to play with it. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, obviously that there's, I'm, I guess there'd be suggested minis for certain adventures and stuff like that. But all of our adventures list the minis you right. need. And we're working on a shot, we're working on a system where you can literally go to the website, download the adventure, and then click a box and it fills uh your shopping cart with um with the miniatures you need for that right but let me i want to phrase it better because there's absolutely nothing wrong with saying hey if you're gonna run this adventure these minis specifically work perfectly with this adventure yep there's nothing wrong with that at all yep but this isn't some Mm -hmm. we're gonna put out a one-time free pdf for first through i mean you're doing a whole (laughs) role-playing game line or a role-playing game that even if people never buy the minis, there's there's a robust role playing game experience here. Yeah, there's a it, it's, it, you can literally play what we've given you so far, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. They wouldn't have hired a full time writer right. if they didn't have bigger plans, right? So we 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 have a very robust campaign setting. Uh, we have little little chunks that are also very thick. Um, I already turned in. A bunch of support material for that setting. Uh, we have a gigantic Bible for the region I'm currently working on. So there's there's a ton of stuff that is going to be put out. So so it's not just going to be a one and done. I mean that that's I I would never sign up for that uh, because quite frankly I, I I want to I want to be your guys's tour guide. I want to write the tour guides. I get I guess to, to put it very clearly. Uh, it's not a cheap marketing ploy. I mean, this is a nope. This is a full on role playing experience. So, what? So, um, like, what? What? Like, when I think dungeon dwellers, I think, oh, I'm going to be dungeon crawling. But when you say you have a full on campaign coming, like, what? What th- is it going to support? Overland wilderness in the dungeon. Okay, so uh, is is the well, it it wouldn't. It's in my opinion, we're we're giving you basic. Yeah, and then it'd be cool if a little bit later on down the road we give you expert, which adds all the overland stuff. It's already implied uh, there, but um, the 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 classic hex crawl. um, It's it's not any V two rules, but it's on my mind. Um, I love wilderness adventures. Um. I I'm not so I'm not such a big fan of the extra planar stuff, uh, but it will be part of it. I mean, the thing is, is that our world is not as connected as the Forgotten Realms, so it's it's extra planar stuff isn't going to be isn't going to be as big a factor. I think there's plenty of great adventures that can be done underground and above ground. Yeah, and I mean, I'm I'm to- I personally I'm totally fine with a good old fashioned kick in the door dungeon crawl personally, but everybody's yep. looking for different experiences. Um, so w- w- the campaign setting, or not the campaign setting, but the setting for the game that you're developing, is it grimdark? Is it high fantasy? How would you describe it? Y- you know, it's funny. It- it's not. Um, it's not any one thing. Uh, I think it depends heavily upon the emphasis the game master wants to put on it. Uh, it is not by default grimdark, but we have a nation ruled by vampires. But it's not Sylvania from Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. It's kind of a mass, Vampire the Masquerade approach. You know, it's it's underground. Um, but we also have the city of Barrowgate, uh, which we featured on a very large map at the at the convention. And Barrowgate is built on the doorstep to the hill to the West Barrow Hills. And the West Barrow Hills have been used as a cemetery by all the peoples for thousands of years. And it is just it is a it is a uh, it is a horrific cancerous kind of a place where all kinds of bad stuff when you comes. say barrow i'm getting excited so yeah yeah Barrowgate, yeah. right yeah. but it's called Barrowgate because it it incorporated these these elven weird stones which protected 
it, it surrounded this massive area, this, this 80, I don't know, 80 odd leagues in one way and 40 odd leagues that way. Um, this area where people have been buried for thousands of years. And so all the, there's a ton of bad stuff just churning there. It's just, it's a cancerous area. And so it's not the chaos wastes, but it's a little more subtle than that. But Barrowgate's built on its threshold. And Barrowgate is a, an adventurer-friendly uh, refuge. So they, they sell potions. They sell, they sell wands. They sell 10. So, so it's like whatever you want, you just go to Barrowgate. Well, I love the idea, too, of, oh, I'm going to go into the Barrows and adventure, but I can run back to Barrowgate, lick my wounds, Go to the tavern. Get before posted. the sunset. Yeah. Yep, and, exactly. Yeah, you run back, and you're like, and you go to. The, and the thing is, is that we have a Green Griffin uh, Tavern right. uh, little booklet you can download for free, and that's like that's our definitive adventurer's tavern. Right. That's our yawning portal. If you're familiar, yeah. With oh it yeah, that. definitely. And it's downloadable for free yeah, right yeah, now. You can I love download it. That. So, what about the rest of the ca- the setting? Is it? I mean, like, are elves like? High elves living in mystical cities uh, are dwarves delving under the mountain, or do you have a different take on things, or what? What's going on there? We we wanted this to be as familiar. We we love innovation, yeah. but we wanted this to be as familiar as possible. So what we want to do is we want to just take. It's like you find a gemstone in the earth. You you, you shape it and then you polish it, and that's what we want to do. Is we want to take all those great core ideas, wood elves, gray elves, you know, whatever, and we want to have all of those in our world. And we want to just polish them up. We don't. We don't need aquatic elves, aquatic dwarves with gills right. and a tail to make our game stand out. And if you want to do that stuff, well, great. No, Run I'm, with it. Make I'm your own. I'm cool world. with that because there yeah. is something to be said for refreshing things. Like, oh, yeah. well, let's do a different take. But sometimes I just want. I the yeah. Familiar. I want. I want. I want to adventure in a in a fantasy setting that is what some people would think of as the default fantasy. There, there has to be some right. degree of predictability in the fantasy setting. Otherwise you have no context for anything. Right. Um, Tecumel is a great example. You talked about Tecumel earlier and I love empire of the pedal throne and the, the, the Tecumel foundation is doing great things right. with their books. In fact, I bought a bunch of the books at North right. Texas, but it's completely alien. You have to, and it's right. really players struggle. Players have to be as familiar with the content as the game master to make any sense of it. Otherwise they're just like, what yeah, is going on yeah. here? So you asked about our elves. Right. We have, we have dwarf in most settings, elves are in decline or they're fleeing across the ocean. Tolkien did that. Our elven nations are robust, healthy. They're just like every other nation. They're, 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 they're to some extent struggling to deal with, you know, massive changes. But the thing is, is that our elven nations, with one exception, are very healthy. We have an elven nation of wood elves. We have an elven nation of, of gray elves. And we also have little, cool little elven fastnesses all over the map. Same with dwarves. Dwarves are all over the place. They're not in decline. Um, yep. And so, so the races are healthy. Unfortunately, that also means like the orcs, yeah, are, the orcs healthy. are healthy. So yeah. like the orcs are able to... Yeah, the orcs are also, are also teaming, right? So when the orcs invaded... And, and push it, a lot it of sounds like southwards. there's plenty. It's it's everything's kind of sort of in transition is what it comes down to. Everything's alive and, and thriving, but it's on the head of a. So there are uh, there are multiple opportunities for adventure with a variety of familiar races and milieus. But yes. then you milieu. I just want to say milieu, and then milieus of fun. And then you also have kingdoms. Run by vampires, so it's it's a nice mix of stuff. Yeah. So it's it it's familiar enough. It's familiar enough. Is what yeah, it and that's to. cool because, like I said, I don't mind trying a new dish at a at a restaurant. In fact, sometimes you discover wonderful things that way you would never have discovered before. Uh, the first time I had Indian food, I really didn't like it, but now Indian food is absolutely one of my favorite kinds of food. But sometimes I don't want, I just want to go get, you know, uh, there's virtue in a right, cheeseburger. Right? I mean, not even a, there's virtue in a yeah, cheeseburger. It's, like, it's a not even a cheeseburger. cheeseburger. It's like a good old Southern meal or, you know, uh, yeah. just something familiar. So I, I like both. Uh, but it's, 
That's 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 DDRPG, and we are the delicious juicy Just, cheeseburger delicious. or plate of lasagna. If you love the plate of lasagna, yeah, and that's and there's nothing wrong with that. See, there's a no, there's a. I think there's a feeling among certain segment of the designers out there that you have to innovate or be fresh just to innovate and be fresh. And no, you don't have to, you don't have to, you can just tell me a good story. Give me a good adventure to play in, you know? So our fans like elves and dragons and dwarfs. And so that's what we really want to get. I don't mind playing around with other stuff at all, but that's always going to be my first love when it comes to fantasy role playing. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, so uh, I got to start drawing us to a close here. What what would you say is other than the feel of it, like the setting and the races and this and that? You know what what would be old school about DDRPG, about Dungeon Dwellers RPG? What what do you feel makes it sort of old school? The power level of it is lower. Pathfinder second edifice that were built to be super heroic sure. fantasy. You know, yeah. It's, uh, if Marvel was to make a fantasy role playing game, it would be. Those two, and those are great games. They, they they are wonderful games. But if you don't want superhero, if you want a gritty right. Fawford and the Gray Mouser, if you want a gritty Elric kind of a story, Dungeon Dwellers does that well because a lot of things just aren't there. I joke you know? with the older, and I, see, I grew up on you know you're you can get one shot in your very first encounter, and you better start rolling up a new character. So I always joke around. You know, it's like I like games where it's like don't even bother to name your character till third level. Not that I ever did that. It's, you know, just kind of joking around, like, don't get too attached until this character is, has, uh, has made it through a couple of scrapes. Uh, but I like that. Like, I, you know, um, I took, I, I run my group through 5e, but in between campaigns, we'll play other stuff. Like, well, I took them through Keep on the Borderlands, NBX, and then I took them through um, some 1e stuff. You know, I think I took them through Ravenloft in 1e. And the difference of play style is tremendous because they learned, oh, you mean my role in the party is really important. And, oh, tactics in the fight is really important. I can't just roll in it's like a... Oak, it's okay to run <laughs> yeah, away, it's okay to run. away and recuperate. And Briarch means I the, the thing is, one of the, one, of the, one of the biggest changes between new school and old school is new school, the idea of it is, is... I'm going to just keep throwing resources against it and eventually win. Right. And old school goes, no, you, you don't want to do that. Yeah. yeah you don't. <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, it, it's, you know, modern players are used to save points in video games. They kind of expect the same thing. And 5e is, to some extent, it, it has those mechanics in yeah. place because that's, what the, that's the goal. But the thing is, that's where Dungeon Dwellers is like, and we have one death save. I don't give you three. I give you one. And if you get clobbered for 15, 20 points of damage, that's the DC to save versus. And and see, I like conflict. that because if you fail it, yeah, dead. I like that you're trying not you're not trying to be everything to everybody because you nope. know there's a certain segment of the gamer tabletop gamers that want this kind of game. I want this kind of game. I like this kind of game. Um, like I, I like that if my character makes it to higher levels. Holy smokes, that's a big deal that that character is like sixth level, right? I mean, that's an accomplishment. You know, we used to, uh, and I, I know you know all about this as a design, you know, as a designer and all that, but, you know, used to, it's different now. Everybody in 5e comes out, every character comes out the gate at a fairly high power level. But used to, fighters came out fairly strong but then they topped off early where a wizard started off very weak, but then that power curve went up and up and up the longer they survived. Same, same, same deal with monks. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Right. And, and I, I personally like that. It doesn't bother me a bit, you know? Um, so it's like, you know, it's my hope you know, that because of the way that all the classes are structured, yeah. it's my hope that all of them feel nice and good right. throughout their careers. Right. That's one of the design goals. Um, which is a, always a great design goal. You want you want every character to be fun to play. I guess what I'm saying is, despite what I think the current school of thought is in role playing game design, there are many players, including myself, who even like it a little bit more if it's harder 
or if it's, I don't even know if harder is the right word. If, if it's, if it's a lower power level where you have to be more cautious, mm-hmm. you have to think a little bit more. There's more yeah. at stake at all levels in old school games. There's way more escape because you can't just play lazy. You can't just kind of like lurk in the right. shadows and shoot your bow. Like one of the big differences in like how we do our experiences, I don't give you experience points for monsters. Oh, interesting. I, Every challenge, every challenge, the game master looks at it and goes, is it a level one? Is it yeah. like a, a super easy challenge or super hard? And that gives you the experience points for that encounter. Oh, and every challenge, every encounter is potentially worth experience points. And I have it structured so that at about every 10 significant encounters, challenging You're gonna level uh, up. Uh, encounters, you level up. But it's but you don't but you can't just you, you can't just grind through ten thousand kobolds to go up a level because you just right because you get it. well you know in um, the in, I know games aren't the real world but in the real world the more kobolds you kill the less they teach you <laughs> you know after you've killed a thousand of them yep. you're not really learning much anymore and so. and and what is challenging for one group may be a walk in the park for another so the game master literally adjusts on the fly the value of those experience points. And they're like, well, you guys took care of the monster in two rounds because you guys were like Tom Clancy splinter cell. Another group will struggle. Well, guess what? More experience points or less experience if the game master feels it's appropriate. Interesting. And that it's not tied to monsters. And that's one of the biggest, that's yeah. one of the biggest uh, differences is it's hey performance. All right. Uh, so last question. Um, I'm at a con. I walk up and you know, at a con, you have all these different opportunities. I can play this game, I can play that game, or I can go over and look at the vendor table, or I can go, you know, whatever. I run into you at a con because you, you're running demos. What is it that you say to me to say, you know, out of all the stuff I could do for the next couple hours, what is the compelling sell, if you will, for me playing Dungeon Dwellers RPG? What is it about it? that I want to put my, that I want to spend my time playing when, when I have a lot of other games around. The elevator pitch. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> basically here's the, here's the long and the short of it. I'm going to give you a familiar experience with important decisions where your actions matter. Uh, the system is going to reward you for heroic play. Um, you're going to feel like a badass. You're going to feel terrified in the next minute. Um, it's going to be a fun, thrilling, very unpredictable experience. From the because we because for example we have a reroll initiative every round, so the cycles that you're used to in other RPGs, the predictability in other RPGs is thrown right out the window. I've played a couple other games that have that mechanic, and I like it a lot because when the if you have a multi round combat that goes past three or four rounds and the initiative's the same, it it takes some of the Dynamic. going last is no different than going right first yeah it's, it's after the first well, it also i don't know it just kind of like it, it it adds some zing to it when the when the initiative changes every uh, when a when a, one of the player characters yeah. has been poisoned and they die on five right. everybody somebody has to go on on <laughs> somebody has to go on six seven eight nine or whatever you're desperate to make those initial right. rolls you know, and and it's it's not predictable. And my players yeah. love it. They take that initiative system, they go home, yeah. and they take it with them for their D and D five E games because I show them how to make it work. Yeah, I've uh, mm-hmm. I've played around in five E and other changing it every turn, but um, or every round or whatever. But and then and then and another thing, another sales point is is you might get you might get to bash a Tolkien style orc in the head with your mace. So. The Cargear orcs have invaded Anher. You will guarantee have opportunities to bash, to bash a Tolkien style orc. orc. The only the only thing more satisfying than than bashing an orc in as a first or second level adventurer is is clearing out the basement of rats in a computer role playing game. So satisfying. All right, uh, I got to wrap this Absolutely. up, man. I really appreciate your time, folks. Again, go to Reaper Mini dot com and uh click on the rpg stuff all the stuff's for free all the all this there's adventures the rules download it check it out uh and there's more to come this is just the beginning of a of a full uh role-playing game experience from from reaper so uh any closing thoughts on that there joseph 
other than basically uh, DDRPGs for all of us. Please grab it. Grab the adventures uh, and, and get back to me. Go to our forums. Go to, D go to our uh, Discord server. Engage me. I would love to talk to you about it because, hey, like I said, this has not been written. This isn't just written for me. It's written for the fans, and I want everyone to enjoy right. it. And, and, you, and you feel like that you've had pretty good reception from those that you've demoed it for? What the results have been... It, at ReaperCon and, and also North Texas RPG Con, it has been overwhelmingly positive. People have enjoyed the heck out of it. Um, and, uh, and and also the feedback, the, the critical feedback that has come forward has been very thought-provoking, well-presented, and it's definitely food for thought. Um, so I'm not jettisoning all you right. know critical uh, uh, criticisms. Yeah. So I'm, I'm open to all of it because I want to... Well, you're in, you're in beta mode. This is the time to... Yeah, yeah we're in beta. Yeah. There's warts, we're gonna, but we're going to fix them. Wait to see what we have planned for spring. It's going to be a very exciting time. All right, cool. I have to, I have to do this to you. It's, I call it the bad joke of the week. The show uh, used to be weekly. You know, up until just a couple of years ago, this was a weekly FM radio talk show, and then it was podcast as well. well now we're podcast exclusive. Uh, so I'm not every week anymore, but I still call it the bad joke of the week because it just has a good ring to it so here's the bad joke of the week joseph knock knock who's there cows go cows go who no silly cows go moo oh, oh nice it's a dad joke it's a total yeah gotta no, love bad. those That's, man gotta love yeah, those yeah awesome yeah my other my son's favorite knock knock joke is knock knock who's there europe Europe who? No, Europe who? Oh, I got oh. a <laughs> Awesome kid joke. Yeah, so that's that's the patented bad joke of the week. And, Very uh, nice. Yeah, so um, I hope you enjoyed that. Yeah, immensely, immensely. Yeah, immensely. <laughs> All right, man. Well, Joseph, thanks so much for your time. I'm excited about what you're doing over there. Hopefully, I get to see you soon. At you know, maybe North Texas again. Maybe I can make it to ReaperCon. Um, to have you. But uh, yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to see where you go with uh, with Dungeon Dwellers RPG. And I definitely hope people check it out. So uh, thanks again. And uh, everybody else, we will catch you next time on Shane Plays Geek Talk. Thanks so much for listening to Shane Plays Geek Talk. I certainly hope you enjoyed this journey into the things we love. For your convenience, show notes with helpful links for each episode can always be found at shameplays.com. You can catch the podcast in several places, including on the blog at shameplays.com, iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, Podbean, Amazon Music, Verbal, YouTube, and more. If you like what you hear and would like to support Shane Plays Geek Talk, you can do so for as little as $1 per episode on Patreon at patreon.com slash shameplays. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time. Stay geeky, my friends.